Good afternoon, everyone. So let's continue our uh, journey into regularization for feature selection. So to step back, our goal with feature selection is to figure out which subset of features to use for prediction and which to ignore. And when we work with a linear predictor, essentially by setting a beta coefficient to zero, we are ignoring a feature. So we can think about feature selection as a matter of figuring out which beta coefficient should be zero and which should be non-zero. And we've seen a couple different ways to do that. There was one method where we, it was the exhaustive search method, that's the optimal method, and that's where we um, essentially give least squares some subset of coefficients, and we try every possible subset of coefficients. We, can, we fit least squares, we look at the cross-validation, mean squared error, RSS, and we figure out which gave the lowest mean squared error. So that would be the optimal method, but we said that that's really expensive when the number of features is large because the number of subsets is two to the power d, so it grows exponentially in the number of features. So we've been looking at other ways uh, <clears throat> to do this that are more computationally um, tractable. And one of the other ways we mentioned, uh, which we'll talk about at the very end today, is this um, forward selection or backward selection where you take a greedy approach. You first figure out the single best feature. Then you figure out which is the best feature to add to that, then which is the best feature to add to those two, and so on. You build up a set of features one by one using cross-validation MSE to guide all your decisions. Okay, so that's another very reasonable approach. And then this third family of approaches we started talking about last time is based on regularization. And the idea here is that we take our familiar RSS loss, which is a thing we have been minimizing uh, for our uh, linear regression or least squares design. But then we add to it a penalty um, we consider two different kinds of penalties. One is a squared, uh, a, a squared Euclidean norm on the weights beta, and the other is a a, a a one norm, or call it a taxi cab norm. One norm on the weights beta, and um, so in both cases, the idea, the intuition behind this is that these penalties here they discourage large betas. And remember, non-zero beta means we're using features. So the hope is that somehow by adding these, we can get, just by optimizing this whole thing entirely, we can get the model, we can get this procedure to choose to set some betas to zero. That would mean we're not gonna be using those features for prediction. And so we'd like to understand if and how that happens for these two cases here. <clears throat> we have you know, basically a choice to make which one we use. Um, yeah, and the, the intuition is that on one hand, we want to minimize RSS, you know, so we're going to try to choose the beta to do that, but we're also going to try to, choo try to choose betas that are not too large. We're going to try to balance those two objectives. And this alpha term here is really critical in choosing that balance. Because if alpha is super small, then this term does almost nothing, and you're pretty much just doing least squares. On the other hand, if this term is massive, so that this is much, much bigger than this, then essentially the model will just set all the betas to zero, because that's the best thing to do to minimize the sum, and of course we don't want to do that either. So we want to do something in between, and we're going to choose alpha itself through cross-validation. Okay, so that's sort of a review of where we were at the high level. Any questions on that? <clears throat> okay, so we first took a look at ridge regression, and it turns out that in this case, uh, we have these nice friendly sum of quadratics, so you can do the optimization, um, you, you can take a partial derivative with respect to the beta coefficients, set that to zero, solve for those betas that cause that gradient to go to zero, and you end up getting this expression for the beta coefficients. So we can do this in closed form on paper. That's great. Um, now let's see what happens when we use it. So we looked at this plot. This is called the coefficient path. It's a plot for some particular data set of the coefficients 
on the vertical axis as a function of alpha. Here, alpha on the left, alpha are very small, so essentially we're gonna be doing least squares. And then on the right, alpha are very large. You can see the optimal solution is zero because basically it says with alpha so large, you just wanna make this term small. This term essentially does nothing because alpha is so large. And minimizing this term, you would just set beta to zero. Okay, so that sort of explains the endpoints. Neither of them are typically optimal. So by using cross-validation, we can go in between. Um, and we find, this is, all the details are in the demo, but basically this is the alpha that was found by cross-validation to minimize the, uh, the mean squared error for the beta ridge parameters. And you can see that it is using coefficients that are a little bit smaller than the least squares versions, um, but none of them are exactly zero, so it is not doing feature selection, which was our original goal. Okay. So that's one of the main methods here, is that ridge regression is not useful for feature selection. <clears throat> okay, so you might ask, well then why are we talking about it? Um, turns out it is a very important method to fight a different problem. What it's good at doing is dealing with highly correlated features. <clears throat> so just to give you a little bit of intuition, if you have two scalar values, let's just call them x1 and x2, that are very correlated, meaning let's say very similar, and you try to invert them, this is a large number, right? As the difference between x1 and x2 shrinks, the denominator shrinks, one over that becomes large. So the bigger, the, this, the closer these are, the bigger this is. <clears throat> so something very similar happens in the vector case. So we have this X matrix. It turns out that if two columns of the X matrix are very close uh, in let's say L2 norm, then when you do this matrix inverse like this, I guess the analogy over here should be, there should be a square there. But, okay, when you do this matrix inverse, that thing in certain dimensions is really large. So as the column, as, it, as two particular columns get closer and closer, that inverse blows up. <clears throat> and as a result, you find that the beta coefficients you get are very large. It's like somehow beta is, is trying to look for very small differences between those two correlated columns or correlated features in order to find that small difference, those beta coefficients have to be really big. They have to amplify the difference. So that's essentially what happens. <clears throat> um, so beta can have very large values. And so now when we look back at ridge regression, we see that it is adding a term that specifically says beta cannot be large in the Euclidean sense. So this is good at fighting the large beta that you get due to highly correlated features. <clears throat> okay, and the next question is, well, maybe it's okay that those betas are really large? Well, it turns out it's not. When you think about how those betas will eventually be used for prediction, you have like this inner product between the beta vector and the x vector, and now if there are very large values in here, they will amplify little, you know, noise-like differences in this particular test x vector that translate into big deviations in y hat. <clears throat> so essentially what you'll see is that the variance component and the bias variance trade-off, that gets really big when you have highly correlated features as a result of those betas being really big. So <clears throat> this causes the mean squared error to be high and the hope is that ridge regression can somehow solve this problem it somehow puts in this penalty that prevents the betas from getting very large, and as a result, it reduces overfitting. It reduces the large values that cause that variance and thus overfitting. <clears throat> okay, so uh, there's a demo uh, where I made a, it's a, it's, a, it's a simple little problem where there are two features in this demo, and um, the data is random. I generated two columns of that X matrix to have a particular correlation. They're quite correlated. 
And then I came up with some ground truth beta values. And then with, with that X matrix and the betas, I was able to get my targets, my clean targets. I added a little bit of noise to get the, the training and test targets. Um, and this is what happened. So the true values I used for beta were 1 and minus 1. <clears throat> you can see them with the dashed lines. If you run least squares on this problem, the values of beta you get are about minus 30, which is, as you can see, way bigger in magnitude than 1, right? So it's really, that correlation is really causing an explosion in the beta values. As a result of those large beta values, um, it is causing a mean squared error that is too high. <clears throat> so what we do is we run uh, ridge with, we try different alphas. So here you can see the alpha is really tiny. So when it's so small, we're essentially getting least squares. But we can also make alpha really huge. And we know in that case, what should happen is all the betas should go to zero. Yes, that's happening here. You can see all the betas are effectively going to zero here. Again, what's more interesting is what happens in between. So as we <clears throat> increase alpha, um, we notice that it starts to bring the beta coefficients more in line with the truth. Over this range of alphas, you can see that they are very close to the truth, which is cool to see. And then if alpha is too large, of course, they get shrunk to zero, and that's not good. But you can, do, you can see that there actually is this region where they're estimating the true values pretty well. So now using cross-validation, um, we, we can do our, you know, cross-validation, k-fold cross-validation, and we can compute this k-fold curve, and you can see that it is predicting that if alpha is too small, the mean squared error is like, you know, 26.5, but if alpha is in that good range, the mean squared error is shrinking down to 26. Of course, if you make alpha too large, now you have a massive bias problem because your betas are going to zero, they really should be close to plus minus one. So here the problem is not with variance, it's with bias. That causes a big increase in the cross-validation MSE. But anyway, we can, we can just do a grid search and we can find the value that minimizes mean squared error. And it's this value, which uh, that's, let's see, right about, about 10. That would be right around, right around here. So it really is giving really good um, really good prediction of those true coefficients. Okay, so this is just a toy example, but it's, it's the reason people care about ridge regression. It's really useful when you have correlated features. It, it helps to battle that correlation. If you don't do ridge, you get, you know, crazy large coefficients and suboptimal performance. <clears throat> okay, and in the lab, you will see uh, ridge regression helping out, because there you're gonna have a a data set that has very correlated features. Okay, so that's ridge regression. Are there any questions? Yes? You, that's great, uh, yes. So, so for this plot, I use ground truth, but yeah. did I use ground truth here? Isn't that based on the level? I had my training data set. Okay. That's it, right? So no one told me the true beta coefficients. I, I just had x, y pairs. And I did cross-validation because like, if I would have used training MSE as my guide, we know that that's no good. But if I use cross-validation, that's uh, a good prediction of what will happen on unseen data. And so, so that led me to this choice, which you know, if you actually looked at the coefficients, they would be the green and the blue ones here. And, Yes, now that we have the ground truth, we can actually verify that they were close to the truth. Um, but we didn't actually need that in any of our design. Yeah. Okay, good question. Are there any other questions? Okay, great. So that is ridge regression. Um, now we can turn to lasso. Uh, let's see, so for lasso, um, there's Dominic Alexander here. Dominic, okay, what about... Um, Ian Gibson? Okay, so Ian, do you remember the lasso cost equation? Uh, it's the norm squared of y minus r prediction. Okay, so that's the and then plus the alpha times the norm of, no, the norm, the 
It is, it is a norm. Yes, it's not the Euclidean norm. It's the, it's the L1 norm. You're right. It is, it is a norm. It's just, um, it's just a particular norm. <clears throat> okay, that's right. So that, that's our cost. Um, so in this case, because of this regularization not being as friendly as a quadratic, um, it's not even differentiable. Because if you, if you remember how the, in just the one-dimensional case, there was a sharp edge down here. So you can't use this technique of setting the derivative to zero and solving for the beta that gives you that. That's not going to work. It needs to be differentiable for that to work. So it is kind of a tricky problem in some sense. However, it turns out that it's what's known as a convex optimization problem. We'll talk more about that in a future unit. Um, but and anytime you have a convex optimization problem, the solution is guaranteed to be computable. It might take a little bit of computational effort, but there are algorithms out there that do it. And for, for us, it's programmed in scikit-learn. Scikit-learn will find the solution. Um, we don't have to worry about it, except maybe computationally. It, you know, for, for high, high dimensions, it could take a little while. So <clears throat> anyway, it can be solved. Um, it's done in the LASSO method in scikit-learn. So now let's look at what happens when we use it. So here is the coefficient path for LASSO. Okay, so we know that when alpha is really small, we're essentially doing something like least squares. And so that's sort of the reference point on the left. And we know on the right, when alpha is really large, we expect to get zeros for everything. And that is, in fact, happening. Um, and it turns out that this is happening exactly. These are exactly zero for all these values. Whereas with ridge, they were never exactly zero here. They only become exactly zero as you go to infinite alpha. But what's interesting about lasso, they're actually exactly zero for all values of alpha to the right of that point. Okay, it's just a different, it's a different optimization problem. It has different properties. It works differently. And more importantly, what happens in between in the middle is very interesting. So as you start to increase alpha, Similar things happen as did in Ridge. All the coefficients start shrinking to the origin. But what's interesting is that at this point, this particular alpha here, this brown coefficient um, all of a sudden hit zero exactly and stayed at zero exactly for all higher alpha. So it turned off. We have essentially said we're not using that feature. Then for a slightly larger value of alpha, now this pink feature turned off. And then if we keep increasing alpha, now the green feature is also off. One by one, these features are turning off until in this range of alpha, there's only one feature left standing, which is this LCA vol. And so according to Lasso, that is the single most predictive feature in the data set. And if you had to use only one feature, that would be the one to use, at least according to Lasso. Um, so that's, that's the thing about Lasso is that the coefficients are really going exactly to zero, so we can use this for feature selection. Yes? So would this be similar to stepwise, or could we use it similar to stepwise? That would be the last one. Um, I mean, it's, so, so what happens is, like, alpha is just kind of this sliding parameter. Alpha is, a, you know, continuous is a real number. So as you, as you slide it, it just turns off more and more coefficients. I guess, so like, <laughs> If it's telling you what the most correlated one, I guess, is with it, could you just go in that direction? I would say, like, coming from the right, if you had to select the five most, or the five best predicting it? Well, it doesn't matter which direction you come from, I guess. Like, you, if you set a particular value of alpha and you solve this, this optimization problem, it will tell you these weights are non-zero, these weights are zero. So implicitly, that's sort of saying, use these features, ignore those features. <clears throat> so yeah, I, I don't know that we would really need to use it stepwise, because it basically just tells us in one shot which features to use. Of course, we do have to make the choice of what alpha we want to use. And that is a, um, a more interesting question that we'll, we'll spend most of today's lecture talking about. <clears throat> So, um, but anyway, at, at a high level, larger alpha leads to fewer non-zero betas. So, right, as we go to the right, fewer and fewer non-zeros. Um, question? Yeah. So we use these features of normalized, right? Could we tell even earlier without the regularization, regularization that uh, LCA is important because its magnitude is important? 
Um, it, it turns out that it, it is that case, but if, if you look closer, um, the order in which they turn off is not directly related to their... Okay, so, so yes, all the features are normalized. They're standardized. We have to standardize the features in order to use any of these methods. Um, but I guess what I wanted to say is, like, if you just look at the beta values of least squares, like this is smaller than these, but the bottom one's turned off, the, the brown one turned off first, even though it started with a higher value. So if you just looked at least squares, you would say this is the least important. But according to Lasso, actually, this one is the least important. <clears throat> and, you know, interestingly enough, like, in some cases, they're even swapping, like the red was bigger, and then, but it turned off first. So there's, yeah, non-trivial stuff going on. <clears throat> okay. All right, any other questions? Um, yes. So with some of the paths of the coefficients, are we able to be more into it? Like the yellow and purple, for the most part, follow the same path. Does that mean that they may be more correlated, or is it just dependent on whatever folder, whatever part of the last folder? Um, OK, so first, I, I want to be careful with the word correlation. So correlation is a very specific, has a very specific mathematical definition. It describes like a particular relationship statistically, which is it's just one way that two features can be similar is, is correlation. Or you know, or you could say like a feature and the target could be correlated. But correlation is not the same as importance for prediction. If it was all about correlation, we could do that simpler method I said where you just evaluate all the correlations, rank your features, and then just cut them off based on that rank. But that works pretty poorly, as we'll see. So what I would say, according to Lasso, these two features are pretty similar in terms of their, um, their, their use as predictors. And I would say that the, the purple and the orange are pretty similar just because of how they behave. They, they kind of you know, shrink and turn off at a similar spot. More than that, um, I, I wouldn't want to use the word correlation, though. That, that's a very specific thing. And in fact, when we talked about ridge and we talked about correlation, we really do mean correlation in, in the traditional sense. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, so, but also the thing to remember is that this is a suboptimal method. So Lasso has its own ideas of what is important. Um, it turns out that, like, if, if you come up with this particular feature, rank which matters to lasso, that's not necessarily the same value that some other algorithm or method would, would bring to those features. Some other method might, you know, have swapped the order of importance. It's just, lasso is a, is a pretty good method, but it's, it has its own peculiarities. Okay. All right. Um, okay, any other questions before we move on? Okay, so the, the next most important thing that I want to stress here is that Lasso is very useful in terms of telling us which coefficients to use, but we should not trust the values of the beta coefficients that it is giving us. Because even if you look at this range of alphas here, where it has selected to use one and only one feature, the blue one, <clears throat> the value of the beta coefficient that it is telling us to use is changing dramatically from this value all the way down to close to zero, right? So there's something inherently suspect about that. Like, clearly, this value of the feature is going to work very differently than this one. So how is Lasso telling us both of those? Um, you know, how is it telling us to use this versus this? And then the other question is, like, are either of those really good values? And the answer is no. Because overall, what happens in Lasso, as alpha gets larger, in addition to features turning off, or the beta values going to zero, you see that the values of the beta coefficients also get close to zero, but in a way we don't want. So those are the two things happening. Fewer non-zero coefficients, but also the amplitudes get smaller. And we don't want to... So this, this first thing is very useful for us. The second thing is a nuisance. <clears throat> we need to basically ignore the values of the beta that Lasso gives us. Just use the pattern of non-zeros. That's useful. Ignore the, the betas themselves. So in, in, 
for example, let's say that we have decided to use this value of alpha, which would say to use these three features. Great, we make a note of those features, and then we would fit least squares using those three features only. Okay, and least squares is not biased. Least squares will give us the correct values for the betas, and they will be much larger than those values. Yes? Can you explain why for Ridge we were able to use the coefficients, and this one we can't? So in Ridge, um, we wanted to shrink the coefficients because with correlation, the coefficients are way larger than we want. The least squares coefficients in, correlated, in the correlated case are dangerously large. And we want to bring them closer to the ground truth. In this case, um, least squares values, if there's no correlation, the least squares values are fine. If you would fit least squares on those three parameters, that's fine if there's no correlation. But lasso is giving us shrunken versions of those. And so that shrinkage will hurt our performance. And I'll show you this in, in some examples. So does that answer your question? Yeah, so yeah. just because ridge, they were like correlated is why it was good? Yeah, so when you have correlated features, the least squares betas end up being way bigger than you want. So ridge helps to bring them back to reality, to the close to the true values. But here, lasso is shrinking everything towards the origin. It's, it's turning them off, which is great, but it's simultaneously shrinking them in a way we don't want. <clears throat> yeah. OK, so that, um, so that sort of brings us to figuring out methods to really use lasso. So here's sort of the summary of what I just said. Um, <clears throat> Lasso yields betas, you know, some subset that's exactly zero, so we can use it for feature selection. That's great. Um, smiley face. Um, on the bad side, lasso's non-zero betas shrink towards zero. That's not good because <clears throat> they are biased towards zero in a way we don't want. So what we're going to do is we're going to keep only the indices of the non-zero coefficients. So here I'm saying... What are the set of coefficient indices j, such that beta j is non-zero? We'll call that like the big set script j. And then we want to run standard least squares regression, but only using the feature indices in that big j set. Okay, so <clears throat> do you standard least squares um, with the lasso selected coefficients. So is that idea making sense? Use lasso to figure out which features to ignore or which betas are zero or non-zero, and then turn to least squares and use only those features. OK. So the tricky part now is choosing alpha. <clears throat> so there's a lot of wrong ways to do this. Um, in summary, as we'll see, we want to focus on the performance. OK, we want to do cross-validation, like always. But we want to focus on the performance of the lasso-selected least squares coefficients, okay. not the lasso coefficients, the lasso-selected least squares coefficients. OK, so, um, <clears throat> right, so let's. Let's kind of dive into the details, and I think as we go through this, you'll see more and more what I mean, more and more what we want to avoid and what we want to do. So I'm going to show you four different approaches. The first two are not recommended, but there's still important things in the implementation to understand because they're very useful. So this, this is the first take. This is the most naive take for how to use Lasso to do feature selection. <clears throat> so. Essentially, okay, the, the first thing is, okay, how do you do, how do you do lasso in scikit-learn? So it turns out it has exactly the same interface that we have seen for linear regression. It's in the linear model library. Instead of linear regression, it's just dot lasso. <clears throat> and so this is how we instantiate, how we, you know, set up that, um, 
that object in our, in our, in our software. Okay. Um, we want to do cross-validation. So we're going to use the same technique as before. Uh, we're going to use this kfold object here that is going to be in charge of splitting our data into training and test sets when we do kfold cross-validation. That's the tricky part that can be done for us. <clears throat> we're going to make a grid of hypothesized alpha values. Generally speaking, you want that grid to be equispaced in the log domain. So here we're doing it um, equispaced from 10 to the minus 3 to 10 to the power 1, or 10. And we're going to use 100 values to get a nice um, smooth curve. In practice, if you want it you know, to run faster, you can use less values. But I just wanted the curves to look nice, so I used a lot of values. <clears throat> And now the rest of the code is structured very similarly to what we saw when we were doing model or selection. So there we had uh, two nested for loops. The outer for loop um, uses the kfold object. That returns a structure that has the training and test sets, training test ind index sets. So every time we go through the outer loop, you get a different set of training and test sets, so we're on different k fold of k fold, right? So that's that's like the k in in k fold. And then we have an inner loop, which is another for loop where we are getting pulling out one of the alphas inner vector. So previously when we did this, we pulled out a different model order. Now we're pulling out a different alpha. Okay, now in the innermost part here. What we do is we set, in our lasso object, we set its alpha to the one we're temporarily using. We fit it on our training data. Notice our training data. We take our full data that we're using for design, and we've split it into training and test. So this is just something we do differently for every iteration of kfold, right? We do this k different times. So this is the particular training folds. We fit lasso. Internally, it's storing those beta coefficients. Then we can do lasso.predict, and we can now put in the test features, get predictions of our test targets, and finally, we can compute the mean squared error, looking at the difference between our predictions and the truth. And here, notice that we are filling out a matrix where uh, down the rows, we have the different alphas, different hypothesized alphas, and across the columns we have the different folds. Okay, so we're essentially filling out this matrix of, of values. Here I'm writing it as sample mean squared error, just to distinguish from statistical mean squared error. So I'm creating a matrix for all the different folds K and all the different hypothesized alphas. <clears throat> so once I go through these two nested loops and I've, I complete that procedure, now I have my full matrix filled out. And I can take an average across each one of the rows. Um, actually, no. Uh, I think the way I did it, the way I wrote it here is, is kind of swapped from what the code does. But basically, if we look at this notation, I want to average over the different folds k. And so we can just do that with a sample mean. And now we'd get a vector across all our alphas. Of These are the... The sample means, you know, we took a mean across folds. <clears throat> now, we know also that we should not necessarily trust these values. So we saw um, in the context of the one standard error rule, we can also compute standard errors for as a function of alpha to get sort of an error bar. And we can use that for one standard error if we want. Or it's just useful to know error bars on these mean squared errors that were returned. <clears throat> okay. So, um, so that's essentially explaining in gory detail of what is done with this nested for loop. Are there any questions about how we're doing this? Okay, so this is very similar to how we did the modeler selection, except for D, now we have alpha, different hypothesized alphas. So it turns out that this procedure, you never actually need to code this yourself. This is just shown for illustration, because scikit-learn does this for you in the command grid search CV, which is one of the most useful commands you will learn all semester. 
because grid search CV allows you to take an arbitrary estimator, like lasso or linear regression, an arbitrary parameter, in this case alpha or whatever else, and basically just run cross-validation to see all the different hypothesized values, and it just returns the results for you. And it, it does this all in one or two lines of code. So here's, here's how you set it up. <clears throat> so you can see we're giving it the lasso object, because that is what we're optimizing. We have to tell it now, you know, we have to give it the parameter grid of things to try. So we set that up over here. We first have to say, okay, what is the parameter of lasso that we want? It's the alpha parameter. And then we say, these are the specific values we want you to try. And those are the same values we set up here. Okay, so those 100 values are, are the specific values of alpha we want you to try. So that's set up here. Down here, we have to tell it what kind of cross-validation to use. So we set up a shuffled k-fold or 10-fold cross-validation here. So we're giving it that. And we have to tell it, you know, what score are we interested in, in evaluating when we do our cross-validation. So as usual, for regression, we're using negative mean squared error. <clears throat> Once that's all set up, we give it our training data. We tell it to fit everything. And it returns uh, a pretty big structure of different results. So here we're saying, OK, just look at the mean test scores across folds. And now, because that's negative mean squared error, we want to negate that to get mean squared error. And so now we have a vector of mean squared errors for the different alphas. Essentially, we have this quantity. Now, we also can get the standard error. Uh, for that, we tell it to give us the standard deviations of the test scores. But <clears throat> there's one little tricky thing we have to do here. Um, so let's look at how we would have done it manually. So this is what, how we said to set it up when we talked about um, standard error before. So here we want to use the NumPy STD. But this DDoF equals 1 means we're using the unbiased version, right? And when we do the unbiased version of the um, standard deviation, you essentially have a, um, you have a 1 over k minus 1 term. OK, you have a 1, uh, sorry, k, a k minus 1 term when you compute the variance. But then because you're computing the standard deviation, that ends up getting a square root on it. And then over here, we have a 1 over the number of folds. That was, that was just how standard error was defined, standard deviation divided by the square root of the number of folds. OK, so you really have a product of these two things contributing to your standard error. <clears throat> OK, now, when you look at how this grid search CV computes standard error, it does not give you the option to do the unbiased version. So it uses the biased version, which means that effectively there's like a 1 over k, and then there's a square root because of standard deviation. So in order to match what we really want to do, where there's this over here, we can, instead of doing this, we, in this stage, div div uh, divide by number of folds minus 1. So that you know, at the end, we need a product of these two terms. And so the standard error or standard deviation contributes this. And over here, we do the other one. 1 over the number of folds minus 1 square root. <clears throat> OK, so in the end, we're sort of tricking, tricking this um, so that we get exactly what we want while dealing with um, standard deviation that's biased <clears throat> or variance, variance estimator that's biased. Okay, I don't know. Is that is that pretty clear? Just try explain the details. Okay, so this is um, so this is again the most naive method, and <clears throat> the trouble with this again is that when because we are we're just using the coefficients returned by lasso to do our prediction. So these are biased. These are shrunk towards the origin. So. Um, when we run cross-validation with these shrunken coefficients, it's not going to choose really the best value. It's choosing the best value if you were forced to use Lasso's coefficients, but we're not. What we really want to do is just use Lasso's, um, 
use the features it selects, but then do the least squares coefficients. <coughs> okay, any questions on this first part? Again, this is biased, so this is not what we want to do. <coughs> but it's just for illustration. Okay, let's move on to another approach that is also not recommended, although it's maybe a little bit trickier to figure out why. So I'll ask you why once I've described it. So in this approach, this is what we're going to do. We're essentially going to use this code here, pretty much as is. And this code is going to tell us the alpha that we want to use. Once we know that alpha, let's say it's this alpha, we're going to say, OK, for that alpha, we got these three coefficients. And now we're going to run least squares with those three coefficients. <clears throat> okay, So that's sort of the high level goal of this code. Um, there's a couple other details we have to, to deal with. So when we were searching for alpha, we were running this you know, k-fold scheme. Well, in every different fold, we might actually have a different subset of betas that it has selected. So at the end of the day, from this code alone, we don't really know which subset of betas to use. We just know the, set of, the value of alpha. So in order to figure out which uh, subset of betas, we, re we rerun lasso on the full training data. <clears throat> Now that we run it on the full training data with this alpha, we will get one model out, beta lasso, and we can now inspect the coefficients. So they're actually printed here. So if you look through the coefficients, there's only one that is exactly zero. <clears throat> and so that is the one that lasso is telling us not to use. It's basically saying use, use all of them except that one. So use seven of the eight features. Um, not surprisingly, it is setting the intercept to zero um, because, as we know, when we standardize the features and the targets, that's sort of what we expect to happen. <clears throat> okay, so now we know exactly which features to use, all but LCP. So using those features, we can isolate them and use them for least squares based linear regression. Okay, so how do we do that? Well. We can first extract the lasso coefficients by doing lasso.coef. So this will print out, this will store them in a vector. Then we can look to see if the absolute value of that coefficient vector is greater than zero. So this returns a logical vector in NumPy, like a vector of true falses. So if the first coefficient is, um, is greater than zero, you'll get a true. If the second one is less than zero, or if the second one is exactly equal to zero, you'll get a false. Okay. So this gives us a logical vector. Uh, that alone is not totally useful to us, but using the numpy where command, we can figure out where in that vector of logicals we have the trues. So that will say like, you know, coefficient index zero, one, three, and so on. And we'll call that subset. So this subset is now a list of integer locations of the features that we want to use. Once we have them, it's very easy to work with it. We just do X training, use all the columns, and use only those rows. So now we have a, our training feature matrix, but it only will contain this, the columns we want. Okay, so that is, that is done right here. <clears throat> now that we have that, we can just run linear regression. We don't want to just run it. We actually want to do cross-validation. We want to you know, compute the cross-validation mean squared error for linear regression on that subset of coefficients. So we do that using the cross-val score command that we saw last time. And that gives us a vector of scores. These are going to be negative mean squared errors, one for every fold. So we just compute the mean across folds. We negate it because of this negative mean squared error. And we get a single number, which is the mean squared error of lasso what we call the lasso least squares method, so or sometimes called the debiased lasso method. Run lasso, look at the coefficients, ignore their values, but look at the pattern of zeros or non-zeros, and then run least squares. Okay, so that's what we're doing here. Uh, fortunately, the mean squared error actually improved. So this is, let's see, this was the cross-validation mean squared error from the biased lasso coefficients. 
these are the bias ones shrunk towards zero. And then this is what we got when we used least squares on those seven, and it's, it's better. So that's, that's what tends to happen. <clears throat> okay. Is this uh, idea making sense, what we're doing here? Okay, now can anyone tell me what, what here is not quite right? Where, what can we improve? What do we do not quite right? Does anybody see it? Why am I calling this the naive method? <clears throat> Any ideas? No? Okay, this is a little tricky. So the problem is with the, with the alpha that we get from this first step. The alpha that we were getting from this first step, if you remember, was essentially coming from this procedure. This procedure chose the alpha for which the biased lasso coefficients had the best MSE, best k-fold MSE. Okay, but we don't care about the bias lasso coefficients. We know that they're corrupted, they're biased. So who cares, who cares what alpha makes them the best? We wanna know what alpha makes the least squares coefficients the best. So that's why this is not quite right. Um, this is the part here that's naive um, <clears throat> because, here I explain it, the alpha on the previous page was selected to minimize the MSE of beta lasso, which is the bias thing, but we don't actually use beta lasso for prediction because of the bias problem. <clears throat> So does everybody understand that little tricky issue? Okay. We want to be really careful how we select alpha. Alpha should be selected so that the least squares, the, you know, the, the least squares estimator that gets the subset of features from, from lasso so that that is performing best. Okay, there's two different ways to do it. The first way is sort of a quick and dirty method. The second way is a little bit more correct, but it takes a little longer to run. <clears throat> So let me show you the quick and dirty method. Um, and then we'll talk about why I, I'm saying it's quick and dirty. Okay, so we're just gonna hard code a for loop. So here's our for loop. And this for loop is going across our different alphas that we're testing out. <clears throat> and so the first part of the for loop, not surprisingly, we, we set alpha in lasso to the particular alpha that we're hypothesizing in our vector. Then we fit lasso on our entire training data. Then, similar to what we did previously, we look at the absolute value of those lasso coefficients, and we figure out, using NumPy where, we figure out which feature indices does lasso return non-zeros. Those are the ones we want to use. And then over here, once we get that subset, we just restrict our training data to those. We run linear regression we do cross val score, we get um, a particular MSE for that particular alpha. <clears throat> and we just run this in a loop, eventually we will trace out a nice curve of MSEs versus alpha. We will also do the measure the standard error uh, because we always remember that our, our mean squared errors are not perfect, so it's a good practice to do this. Okay, and so in doing this, when we look at our cross val MSE, versus alpha, we can see that we have this curve. So this is the, the mean across all our k-folds, okay? And we can see there's this sort of U-shaped trend where, you know, things are not best at the edges. Things, well, things should be best in the middle. If things, if things are best on the edge, then you didn't build your grid right. You need to look at grid points more in that direction to figure out if you can do even better by going more in that direction. So. We have a, a well-constructed grid, meaning the best alphas, the ones that minimize the mean squared error, are somewhere in the middle. Okay, and so this is, I think all these values, even though this little cursor is here, all these values are equally good. So according to, the, to this method, all those alphas are legitimate. <clears throat> Does anybody know why this curve has these flat lines? Why is it like piecewise linear like this? Exactly. As I move alpha from here to here, lasso is selecting the same subset of coefficients. 
And then so, and then I'm just using those for least squares. Least squares is, there's nothing random about least squares. So if I tell least squares to use those coefficients on, um, <clears throat> it's, it's gonna give, yeah, it's gonna give the same mean squared error. Um, so basically, yeah, that, that's why. So that's why all these alphas for this method are, are equally good. You could use any of them. Okay, so um, if we do this, cross-validation mean squared error has improved beyond this technique because now we're doing the correct se selection of alpha, not choosing alpha based on the biased coefficients. <clears throat> okay, so this is one of the recommended techniques. Um, <clears throat> Good time to pause for questions. Is this making sense, sort of what we're doing? Okay, any, any questions or anything? Okay, so now the trickier question is, is there something about this that's a little bit off? This is harder to see, but it kind of goes like this. Okay, when you think about doing cross-validation, what you really should be trying to do is use one fold for testing and the rest of the fold for training Right? So all of your design should be restricted to the training part, the training folds, and the test fold should not be used in the design at all. So if you look closely at what's happening here, that's actually violated because in, this is really a two-stage technique. In the first stage, when we ran lasso, we used all the data. So in this cross-fail stage, when we're holding out one part for our test, we actually use those samples to design alpha earlier, uh, or, or, or to design, um, not, not alpha, to design the, the coefficient which told us which subset to use. So there's, we're not doing things really in the spirit of cross-validation, we're cheating a little bit. So someone might say, well, okay, if I want to avoid this cheating thing, is there another way to do this? And the answer is yes, and that is what I'm going to describe in this very last method. It's a bit of a more sophisticated approach. It uses what's called a pipeline in scikit-learn. So in scikit-learn, a pipeline is like a chaining together of several estimators. And once you chain them together, you can treat them as a single estimator, and you can take that single thing and plug it right into grid search CV to do your optimization. So in this case, <clears throat> The pipeline really has sort of three separate things we want to do. First, we want to run lasso. Then, we want to select features based on the non-zeros in lasso's coefficients. Finally, we want to run least squares based on those features. So three things. Um, so in terms of scikit-learn, the first thing we do with linear model.lasso, right? The last thing we do with linear model dot linear regression, those things. The middle thing, you have to implement using something called select from model. So what this select from model method does is if you give it a vector of coefficients, it looks at which are non-zero and it says, those are the ones we're gonna use. So it's just like this little kind of glue thing that you stick between lasso and linear regression, but you can't, in building the pipeline, you can see there's two steps in the pipeline. It turns out, just from the way things are architected, this can't really be a separate stage in the pipeline. It sort of needs to be applied to this. So that's why this pipeline, you know, technically it has two stages, but in spirit it has three. <clears throat> okay, so, th and this is how you set up the pipeline. You just basically, whatever code you would, you would run to instantiate these things, you stick those in this pipeline and we're calling the result of this the pipe. <clears throat> okay. The cool thing now is once that pipe is built, you can see down here we do grid search CV on that entire pipe. And when we when we fit it, it pumps the data through all these stages here. Sometimes people also put standardization in the pipeline because technically the way we're doing standardization is also a little bit cheating. We're using the full training data to do standardization rather than using only the training folds, you know, standardizing based on the training folds alone instead of all the data. So to do this, you know, really correctly, according to the, the spirit of, of cross-validation, you would also want to have um, the, the standardization um, as a first stage. But 
Okay, we're not going to do that, <clears throat> just to keep it simple. So this is the pipeline. Um, any questions on, on that? Okay, so when we set up grid search CV, we have to tell it, of course, which parameters we're going to use. This is a little bit more complicated now because we have to tell it which parameters of our pipeline. So first, you have to say, are the parameters in this part or this part? So we're telling it uh, the parameters are in the lasso part. Now, the lasso part actually has two stages itself. So we have to tell it, is it in the estimator stage, this one, or this other selector stage? Well, it's in the estimator stage. And finally, we have to say, well, which parameter in lasso is it that you want me to, to, opti you know, to, to try different values for? Well, it's the alpha one. OK, so I don't expect you or me or anyone to really have memorized this syntax. So if you're curious, like, what is the right string to put in, you can run pipe.getparameters.keys, and it will show you all the different options of what this could be. And then you can select from them, and that's where I got this. <clears throat> okay, so we set up our pipeline. Uh, we're using cross-validation as before, score as before. We fit in our data. And then just like before, we get mean squared error uh, curve, and we get our standard error curve. And this is what they look like now. So instead of the piecewise linear curve, we now have a curve that is you know, a little bit more random looking. Um, we, we do see that there's a clear minimum mean squared error in terms of alpha. So this could be one option. We might say, OK, let's use this alpha. Let's see what happens. Um, so we can run. Um, actually, it's already run the grid search for us. So, so we don't have to run like a separate grid search CV. It already gives us all the data we want. It turns out that this cross-validation mean squared error is a little bit worse than this one. And so you might ask, well, OK, that's too bad. Is there a way we can fix this? And the answer is yes, you have to use the one standard error rule. Because it's often the case that when you just minimize the mean squared error or whatever uh, criteria you want, it gives a model that's a little bit too complex. And so if you, can, you can use Occam's razor to say, what is which model um, is equally reasonable from the standard error perspective, but simplest. So if you remember the way that one standard error rule goes, you first find the minimum. In this case, it's not a D min, but it's like an alpha min. You look at the standard error bar that is above alpha min. That ends up being this value here. And you say, what is the simplest model whose blue sits under that target. So this is the target, MSC target. And you can see simple model is actually to the right. Because remember, as alpha gets larger, you turn off more coefficients, right? It's opposite from model order. Model order D, as that gets smaller, that's simpler. In this case, simpler is to the right. So you go, you say, to the right of of here, what is the simplest model? It's right there. So that one is the simplest one, and that gives you this alpha, which is a little bit different. When you use that alpha, you recover exactly the same mean squared error that we had over here. Okay. So one standard error rule to the rescue, it worked. <clears throat> okay. Any questions about this? So either of these two last methods are the recommended ones to use lasso for feature selection. OK, the very last thing I want to very quickly show you is, is the results of the demo. So we compared against a bunch of other methods. The first one is exhaustive least squares, exhaustive search. This is the optimal method. This is the performance it gave, 388072. <clears throat> OK, not surprisingly, regular least squares, where we used all the coefficients, is the worst. Ridge. Um, is also not really doing well here because it's not a correlated data set, so it's not doing what we need. Lasso, the biased lasso, is actually even a little bit worse than Ridge. Both of them have coefficients shrunk towards the origin. We don't like that. Then we have this debiased lasso procedure. That was better, but still not very good because the alpha it used was based on the biased lasso coefficient, so that's not good. 
Then we have our two versions, uh, the for loop and the pipeline versions we just discussed. They are much better, but still not exactly where the exhaustive search is. Then this, um, this SVS, this SFS, this is the sequential feature selection. This is, in this case, I did backwards selection. So I started with eight, then I went to seven, six, and so on. Um, that's a good method. And interestingly, it is actually tying the optimal. Um, it's not exactly optimal, but I'll write it ties, it ties the optimal. <clears throat> and finally, the last method was this, this method based on mutual information, or you could run correlation. It is also pretty bad. So at the end of the day, the best methods were lasso, um, properly run lasso, either the for loop or the pipe, or sequential feature election, or in this case, because we could run least squares exhaustively, that would be the, the right thing to do. Okay. All right, so that, um, that's all I wanted to cover today. Sorry, I went a little bit over. Any questions on anything? Okay, see you guys on Friday. <clears throat>